rather than just over email. Um, and I'm really excited to jump into some uh, titles from across all our inference. So we're going to start with Soho Crime. And we can go to the next slide, Stephen. Excellent. So some of you may have heard me talk about this in a different buzz, but we're really excited to have Gary Phillips coming to Soho Press for the first time. If you're not familiar with Gary, he is, is an acclaimed crime legend. So he's new to us, but he's not new to crime fiction in general. He's been writing uh, for over three decades. He's published novels, comics, novellas, short stories, and edited or co-edited several crime anthologies, including the Anthony Award winning The Obama Inheritance. Um, and Violent Spring uh, in his debut was named one of the essential crime novels of Los Angeles. And he's also just fun fact, a story editor on Snowfall on FX, which is a great show if you haven't checked it out. Anyone who knows Gary's crime fiction will already be aware of kind of his twin career as an activist. And that work is inextricably entwined with his fiction. So if you're looking for kind of socially minded crime fiction, I would absolutely recommend checking him out. In One Shot Harry, uh, this takes place kind of um, during the race and civil riots in 1963 Los Angeles. Uh, they, they provide a powerful backdrop in this, what turns out to be kind of a riveting historical crime novel about an African-American forensic photographer seeking justice for his slain jazz musician friend. So like I said, the setting is LA 1963 and really truly no crime writer writes LA better than Gary who grew up in South Central LA. So not only is it, he's really passionate about it just as a setting because it's his home, but also he writes about it with an incredible insight and personal knowledge. Um, African-American Korean War veteran Harry Ingram earned his living as a news photographer. He chases police radio calls uh, while dodging baseball bats. Um, which, you know, occurs way more often than you think it might, especially in 1963 LA. So with Rachel, with, <laughs> sorry, with racial tensions running high on the eve of Martin Luther King's freedom rally, Ingram risks ending up one of the victims at every crime scene he photographs. But when he hears a call over the police scanner to the scene of a deadly automobile, automobile accident, he recognizes the vehicle described as belonging to his good friend and old army buddy, the white jazz trumpeter, Ben Kinslow, with whom he'd only just reconnected. The LAPD declares the crash an accident, but when Harry develops his photos, there are signs of foul play. And only he is not necessarily privy to it, but he's the only one who really wants to follow through with this evidence. He feels compelled to play detective, and even if it means putting his own life on the line. So he's only armed with his wits, his camera, and sometimes his Colt 45. He plunges headfirst in the senior underbelly of LA society, tingling with racist, leftist, blackmailers, gangsters, zealots, and lovers, all in the hopes of finding something resembling justice for a friend. And that is key in all of Gary's work, as it is in his activism, his life of activism, which is justice obtained from outside the system. So if you like James Elroy and Walter Mosley, and I don't make those you know, comparisons lightly, you definitely have to add Gary Phillips to your list. Um, if you follow us too, I can say with confidence uh, that you'll be seeing more of Gary soon. So stay in touch with, with us at Soho Crime. And we can move on to the next one. Staying within the crime, our crime imprint, we have Don't Know Tough. This is, uh, we're really excited to be publishing uh, Eli Craner's debut crime novel, which is at its heart, Friday Night Lights meets Southern Gothic. Um, it's got a very noir feel, but set in kind of the con contemporary set. And it's really, really perfect for readers of Megan Abbott and Wiley Cash. I think the melding of those two authors is absolutely what is this book is at its heart. Um, this is a fun fact about Eli before I tell you more about the book itself, which is great in its own right, but he was actually the winner of Soho Crime's inaugural Peter Loves the First Crime Nival Contest. Uh, that's a mouthful, but we're really excited to have kind of been in, gotten in touch with uh, Eli's work through that contest and just really excited to kick off his career, which we believe will be a long one. So jumping into the plot, Trent Powers relocates his family from Anaheim to Arkansas in order to take over as head coach of the Denton Pirates, a high school football team powered by a volatile but talented running back named Billy Lowe. Billy comes from an extremely troubled home, a trailer park where he's terrorized by, and that's not, a, that's, that's not an exaggeration, he's truly terrorized by his unstable mother's abusive boyfriend. Billy takes out his anger on the field, and there is plenty of it. Um, but it, it is not long before he crosses a line. But instead of punishing him, though, uh, Trent takes Billy into his home, hoping to protect his star player as the Pirates begin their playoff run. Also, he seems, you know, um, he sees some of it himself in Billy as well. Um, but when Billy's abuser is found murdered, nothing can stop the explosive chain of violence that follows and threatens to tear the town apart. 
So let me just jump back to Eli really quick, who really walks the walk and talks the talk, much like um, Gary Phillips in his own right. This novel is infused with the nitty gritty of American football. Eli played quarterback at every level from peewee to professional and then coached high school football for five years. So this novel, once again, is infused with uh, authenticity. Along with fiction, Eli also writes a nationally syndicated sports column, and I would definitely recommend his craft column, which some of you may have come into contact with, it's called Shop Talk, which appears monthly over at our friend Crime Read. So he is definitely a must-watch author, and this is a must-read novel, sure to garner a lot of media attention, which is, you know, it's already getting. And again, you'll see from his writing that Eli is going to be around for a really long time, so this is your chance to get in on the ground floor. And if you want to know more about Eli or just kind of check out his vibe, we have a great video in our booth that you should watch. So we can skip to the next slide, Stephen. Awesome. Bad Actor is Mick Herron, the man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Bad Actors is the eighth novel in Mick Herron's acclaimed, uh, more than acclaimed, Slow House, sorry, Slow House series. Um, there's so much to say about this British writer. It's really hard to know where to start, but the really brief headline is, and again, no exaggeration, that Nick Heron is the late Carré of our generation. He is one of, if not the greatest spy writer working today. He's a CW Gold, CWA Gold and Steel Dagger winner. And again, I don't really have time to list all of his awards, but there are plenty. Um, really, truly working at the top of his craft and gaining more, more acclaim and notoriety uh, with each publication. So again, you might be familiar with the Slough House series. This is the eighth in series, but if you haven't, you know, dived in yet, I would definitely highly recommend jumping in as soon as you can, speaking of getting in on the ground floor. Um, this series follows a group of disgraced MI5 spies, and also it will soon be a series on Apple TV Plus starring Gary Oldman as the irascible central figure, Jackson Lamb. Bad Actors is once again set in London. Uh, we start at MI5 headquarters where a scandal is brewing that could disgrace the entire intelligence community. The Downing Street Super Forecaster, a specialist who advises the Prime Minister's office on how policy is likely to be received by the electorate, has disappeared without a tra trace. It's up to Claude Whelan, who was once the head of MI5, uh, to, tra to track her down. The trail leads him straight back to the Regent's Park itself with first deaf Diana Taverner as chief suspect. Meanwhile, her Russian counterpart, Moscow Intelligence's first desk has chiefly showed up in London and shaken off his escort. So Claude is left to wonder, are the two unfortunate events connected? And of course, over at Slough House where Jackson Lamb presides over MI5's most uh, demoted agents and disgraced agents, the slow horses as they're called are doing what they do best and adding a little bit of chaos to an already unstable situation. So that sounds very complex, which it absolutely is. Again, this is great espionage uh, spy fiction, but People who love Nick uh, love him also for his wit and humor, uh, which the series is rife with, and this writing is rife with, not at the expense of kind of the sophisticated espionage element. Nick Heron is, and this series is, you know, the work that correctly and kind of eerily predicted essentially Brexit and a lot of um, the kind of movements that are happening in England right now in, in the UK. So if you're looking for an author to the backlist that you can fall into, Nick is the one to check out. Every everyone who kind of comes to this series and comes to mix, mix work later in the game, like demands to know where we've been hiding him. So we're not hiding him. We want everyone to be exposed to his work. So please check out Mick Heron's Slough House series. And next up. So we're actually transitioning to Soho Crime now, our literary titles, but there's definitely some crossover here, especially for this title, After the Lights Go Out by John Bircher. Um, I'm always gobsmacked by this cover, so I do want to call out how gorgeous it is. Um, John Bircher is not a debut novelist, but again, new to Soho, and we hope will be in the Soho family for a long time. He is the critically acclaimed author of Three Fifths nominated for the Edgar Anthony and Strand Awards for Best First Novel, shortlisted for the CWA New Blood Dagger, a Guardian Best uh, Novel of the Year, a Sunday Times Best Novel of the Year, a Financial Times Best Crime Novel of the Year, and a Chicago Tribune Best Book of the Year. So that was all a mouthful, but you get the sense that John, again, is a highly acclaimed writer. And we uh, expect nothing less for his second novel, which is a harrowing and spellbinding story about family, the complications of mixed race relationships, and also the price athletes pay to entertain, which turns out to be really, really, really moving and hard and gritty. So this plot follows Xavier Scarecrow Wallace, who is a mixed race MMA fighter on the wrong side of 30. Um, Xavier is fighting the fight of his life. He can no longer deny that he is losing his battle with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE, also known as pugil pugilistic dementia, which he has, you know, presumably kind of um, caused by his MMA career. 
Uh, John Vercher creates an absolutely, again, spellbinding story as Xavier navigates the increasingly denser fog of memory loss, migraines, and paranoia that he's, um, that he's in. All while uh, Xavier tries to stay in shape while he waits for the call that will reinstate him after a year-long suspension. He trains every day at the Philadelphia gym owned by his cousin and manager named Shop, who is a retired champion boxer to whom Xavier owes an unpayable debt. So a side note, anyone looking for kind of gritty, realistic novels set in Philadelphia, this is definitely the book uh, that you want to check out. Xavier's problems don't end outside the ring, though. He has been forced to commit his older father to a nursing home because of the progress of his father's end-stage Alzheimer's, which you think might kind of connect Xavier to him because they're experiencing similar things, albeit at, you know, generation, in, in a different generation. But Xavier's father is white, and dementia is revealing his latent racism, which sadly and uh, movingly allows Xavier insight into why his black mother left the family or when Xavier left the family when Xavier was young. Um, then Xavier is offered a chance at redemption, a last minute comeback fight in the largest MMA, MMA promotion of his life. If he can get himself back in the game, he'll be able to clear his name and pay off shot. But with his memory in shreds and his life kind of crumbling around him, can he hold on to the focus he needs to survive? And I'll be honest, there are really no easy answers or happy endings here. This is a literary noir, a really heartbreaking novel, uh, an excellent character study, especially from a character that doesn't really get necessarily a lot of attention in mainstream literary fiction, up there with the greatest and most impactful sports novels of our time. And after the lights go, goes out, after the lights go out, I mean, again, you'll kind of hopefully pardon the pun, but it really, really does pack a huge punch. So that is after the lights go out, which we hope you'll check out. Excellent. Next, totally different end of the literary spectrum, we have Passers Through by Peter Rock. Peter Rock is the author of nine previous works of fiction, including My Abandonment, which won the Alex Award and was adapted into the highly acclaimed novel, sorry, film, Leave No Trace. He is an extremely decorated author, the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. If you're familiar with Peter's work, you'll know that he is the master of exploring liminal spaces, especially in the Pacific Northwest intertwining very human plots with borderline fantastical elements that will transport you. Um, this is a slim haunting novel. I think the cover does a really good job of kind of conveying that haunting element. Um, it is about a father and his estranged daughters reconnecting to try to understand a decades old trauma. Again, this is part ghost story, part exploration of family aging, how we remember the past. So at age 11, Helen disappeared in the wilderness of Mount Rainier National Park while camping with her father, Benjamin. She was gone for almost a week before being discovered and returned to her family. Um, Peter picks up, Peter Rock that is, picks up 25 years later and after more than two decades of estrangement because of this incident, when Helen and Benjamin reconnected at home in Portland, Oregon to try to understand what happened during the days she was gone. This is also, you know, kind of in, uh, it's part um, transcript because the way they, Helen does this is they kind of record these interviews between them and there's always a lot of kind of um, true, quote unquote, false documents in Peter's work alongside the actual novel and narrative. And this is also where the quasi-fantastical, even mildly horror elements come in. Because meanwhile, Benjamin meets an odd pair, a woman and a boy who seem driven to help him learn more about Helen's disappearance. And they send him on a journey that will lead him to a murder house, moments of body horror and possession, and an uncanny bone-filled body of water known as Sad Clown Lake. So if you want some eerie vibes, definitely check out Passers Through. And Peter is really a genre of his own, but if you like Ben Lerner or even enjoyed the recent smash hit Disappearing Earth, I would highly recommend this one, which again, I can guarantee you pretty much that you're reading a single day and will be left at least mildly rattled. It's a haunted, starkly lyrical exploration of family, memory, and the border between life and death. Next up. Awesome. Thank you guys for sticking with me. I have two teen titles to talk about, which as Stephen said I am the So Teens editor, so I'm very, very partial to my, I'm very partial to them. Um, but the first up we have a really unique novel, The Color of the Sky is the Shape of the Heart by Chase Bill. This is a really unique YA book, um, now in translation for the very first time. Originally titled Ginny's Puzzle in Japanese, this award-winning debut broke literary ground in Japan for its exploration and depiction of diaspora prejudice and the complexities of a teen girl's experience growing up as Korean in Japan. Um, it is a range, it's a very slim novel. I know we know we're still not in person, so you can't see it, but um, it's a short one, but nevertheless, it's really deep and really, again, packs a punch. It is arranged as a series of diary entries, um, a confessional first person narrative by 17 year old Ginny Park. Well, she keeps the reader at somewhat of a distance at first. You slowly piece together kind of the pieces of her life 
You learn that she is about to get expelled from high school again. Uh, she is in Oregon. And Stephanie, the picture book author who took Ginny into her Oregon home after she was kicked out of school in Hawaii, she's not upset about this. She only wants to know why. Um, Ginny, you learn, has always been in between. She can't bring herself to open up to anyone about her past or specifically about what prompted to her to flee her native Japan. Then among scraps and papers and drawings of Stephanie's stories, she finds a mysterious note that changes everything. And the note says, the sky is about to fall, where do you go? So that is the question that the book answers. Where is home for Ginny? Uh, what does home mean? So in witty, witty and brutally honest vignettes and interspersed with old letters from her expatriated family in North Korea, Ginny recounts her adolescence growing up Zainichi, a Japan-born Korean, and the incidents that forced her to leave years prior. And inspired by her own childhood, author Chase Hill creates a portrait of a girl who has been fighting alone against barriers of prejudice, nationality, and injustice all of her life, and one only searching for a place to belong, which especially in young adult fiction feels universal. And again, if you like those themes, I would highly recommend checking it out. And I would say this is equally of interest to readers who have no knowledge of the historical context of Koreans who are Japanese citizens or Koreans in Japan, and as well as those readers who find themselves represented in these pages. So it really does explore a very underexplored, I would say, um, element of Korean culture, again, especially Korean culture within Japan and Japanese culture in general. Um, again, it's a bite-sized book that packs a huge punch, very reminiscent of Min Jin Lee's classic Pachinko, and also has kind of the dark lyricism of Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mango Street. So that is The Color of the Sky as the Shape of the Heart. And last up, we have What's Coming to Me by Francesca Padilla. Um, I am really happy to say this is my first acquisition at Soho Teen, and I'm really happy to bring Francesca into, this, into the fold. Francesca is a debut author, and this book is perfect for fans of I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, overlaid with kind of a pulse-pounding thriller aspect that touches on socioeconomic issues in the vein of Tiffany Jackson's work. So I would say Monday's Not Coming or even Grown. So just diving right into the plot, What's Coming to Me is centered around 17-year-old Minerva Gutierrez. Um, Minerva works a part-time job at Duke's, a legendary ice cream stand on the boardwalk in her hometown of Nautilus, which is not a real town, but is set in a Long Island. So you can have a, you know, you probably get a feel of what that, uh, that vibe might be like. Minerva's boss is abjectly terrible. He's mean. He constantly tries to rip employees off and he is inappropriate with his female staff. But Minerva has no choice but to work there because she has to make ends meet. That's where a little bit of a personal mystery comes in. The reader learns that Minerva is on her own and that her mother has been sick for a long time and is not currently present in Minerva's life. What you do know for sure is that Minerva essentially is living on the razor's edge. Um, she's in charge of coming up with rent, for example, in addition to just taking care of her basic needs as a 17 year old. The event that kicks off the story is that Dukes gets robbed while Minerva is working, and that amazing action-packed scene echoes in Minerva's life. Um, the next day, she gets unceremoniously kicked out of her second starts program at school for poor attendance, despite the fact that only a year ago she was an A-plus student. At that point, Minerva is left with only one option, a plan hatched with her awesome friend Cece. They're going to pull off a heist at Dukes in order to find the money that is rumored to be in, um, to have kind of precipitated this robbery in the first chapter and get what they're rightfully owed, getting revenge on Minerva's boss in the process. So most relatable of all, Minerva really wants out of her dead end town and escape kind of the traumas and hardships that are piling up around her. The steps that they, they, pull, they take to pull this off, including recruiting an estranged friend of Minerva's from her quote unquote life before, um, are enough to, on their own, I think, to justify the existence of this book. But the heart comes in as you puzzle together the mystery of what's happened in Minerva's life as she real, reveals these memories of her mother. Her mother was a complicated figure that I think a lot of teen re readers will relate to, but nevertheless is a person who fought tooth and nail to give Minerva the, op Minerva the opportunities that she rightly deserves. So uh, again, this book, I think at its heart, is about a lot of things, but essentially about a teen girl fighting for what she deserves and also fighting to take care of herself when no one else and no entity is really stepping up to the plate for her. And I think that's not only really important, but relatable, especially for a large swath of teen readers who might honestly relate to that, a group I think not often represented in young adult books. So, but to me personally, kind of the most moving part of this um, is that Francesca highlights the internal struggle of what it means to believe that you deserve to be taken care of and to like actually get to the point where you do believe that you deserve to be taken care of. And I think the title really speaks to that. 
So again, this book is so many things and it's often funny and really fun. Um, Francesca herself describes it as euphoria, but funnier because they do treat a lot of the same things, but really it is a serious treatment of serious issues, including living in poverty, caring for a sick caregiver and substance abuse. And in Francesca's words, again, euphoria with funny moments. Um, the ending too, I always like to give a little insight into this because I know people have strong feelings about it, but the ending is hopeful and realistic, uplifting without being saccharine. Minerva ends up connecting with people in her life who will help and care for her. And honestly, it made me cry, which I think is a really important element in young adult too. So I really do hope you'll consider it uh, for maybe YA collections or just for your own personal reading. So what's coming to me by Francesca Padilla. And that's it. Thank you guys. Um, check out a virtual booth. Uh, yes. Casey, hello. Um, we have galley giveaways. And also I should mention there's the Eli, Eli Craner video. And there is also a video from Francesca. So if you want to kind of hear about what's coming to me in her own words, please do visit the booth. And DRCs are available on NetGalley and Idlewise. And, you know, you can always reach out to see if we have any physical galleys available. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. That's it for uh, our book buzz. Uh, thanks for joining and uh, have a great rest of your day. So thank you so much. Bye. Oh, look, Terry's here just lurking. <laughs>